Alrighty, well, good afternoon and welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us today for another National Family History Month program. Uh, today we are having our Lineage Society panel discussion and I'd like to uh, thank and welcome our presenters who have agreed to present today. Um, we have Terry Brasco from the Swedish Colonial Society. We have Evelyn McDowell from the Sons and Daughters of the U.S. Middle Passage. We have Diane Oliver from the New Jersey chapter of the Daughters of the American Revolution and Mark Schmidt from the Mayflower Society. So again, thank you all of you for uh, agreeing to, to present today and you know, kind of tell us a little bit more about your organization. Um, so interested people can can join and and take advantage of, of those benefits. Um, today's program is going to be split into two parts. The first part will be a scripted Q and A. We have some questions that we have prepared that we will be asking our our panelists, um, and then the second half will open it up to the audience. But the audience, please feel free to submit your questions at any time using the Q and A or the chat button um, in the Zoom dashboard, and we'll address them in the the second half of today's program. Uh, there will be a survey at the end of the webinar, so if you have time, we ask you please complete the survey. We always appreciate any feedback that you have. Um, and if you're looking for more information on anything related to genealogy, uh, Regina Fitzpatrick, who is my co-host today, um, has developed a fantastic genealogy research guide that's accessible 24-7 on our website um, at the web address on the screen there. And we'll send that out in the chat so that everybody has a live link. Um, just before we get underway, I want to just go over the Zoom dashboard for those of you who might not be familiar. This is what your dashboard should look like if you're using a PC or a Mac. If you're using a mobile device, the dashboard may look a little bit different, but all the features will still be there. In the bottom left hand corner, you can see your audio settings. So if you're using an external listening device like a headset or earbuds, you can make sure that they're connected properly there. At any point during the presentation, if you run into any issues, there is a raise hand button in the middle. You can click on that and that'll alert me. I will send you a message in Zoom and hopefully be able to solve any problems that you are having. And as I mentioned, if you have any questions or you want to contribute to the conversation, there's the Q&A and the chat buttons. Please feel free to use them. And again, we'll address your questions after the scripted Q&A part of the program. So with that being said, let's get this discussion underway. So Regina, would you like to kick us off? Sure. Uh, everybody, first, I would like to say thank you. It's a true honor to have uh, all of you here celebrating our state's love of um, history and where we all come from. So thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, could you please tell us about your organization? And Terry, I will start with you uh, with some more information on the Swedish Colonial Society. Hi. The Swedish Colonial Society was formed in 1910 by Amandus Johnson to promote the history, the knowledge of the history and um, the happenings around a very small um, colony that was here before William Penn. Uh, it uh, was found in Delaware, southeastern Pennsylvania, and southern New Jersey. And um, we've been working for over 100 years now to let the world know that the Swedes were here and came, uh, came here in 1638 and have been here ever since. Uh, is there anything else you need to know? Yeah, that's fine. I've never anything, done this before, so this is my first you time. Want to share. I, I will I will say, Terry, one of the really interesting things um I learned, I got to speak with somebody who was a descendant from one of the Swedish settlers who ended up uh settling in, in Salem County. And in the genealogy collection, like we have a two volume history of the Swedish settlement. And until this woman brought that to my attention, I had absolutely no idea how rich the history is, uh, the interplay between the Dutch and the Swedes and the power struggles. And then like with the um, with the English coming in and and essentially taking over, like that is a really fascinating um, time period that I'm really interested in learning more about. I think those books are the ones written by Amandus Johnson, and they're very, very informative. Some of the um, information might be a little suspect since our since doing all those all the research over the years, they've uh, managed to find other um, 
other facts that um, sort of dispute some of it, but uh, um, we also have, we just finished a 25 year project of the Swedish churches um, in in Pennsylvania. And also in, it, it covers also the uh, small, the small church in Wilmington and the churches in um, South Jersey. Most people don't know that there was a colony here before William Penn ever showed up. Um, we showed up in 1638 and uh, the, um, the area changed hands between the English and the Dutch and the Swedes. Uh, we didn't last all that long, but we had a very big impact on what happened in early Delaware history, early New Jersey history, and early Pennsylvania history, especially around, in and around the area of Philadelphia. Um, one of our oldest churches was begun in 1698. The cornerstone was laid, and at 17 and in 1700 the uh, Gloria Day, which is also called Old Swedes Church in Philadelphia, opened its doors. And we are the only building in Philadelphia that we can that can be verified that William Penn actually walked the floor of. Very interesting. Thank you so much. Evelyn, could you please tell us about uh, the sons and daughters of the U.S. Middle Passage? Absolutely. First of all, I want to say thank you for inviting me. And I want to acknowledge, uh, you know, the committee for putting it together. Thank you for doing that. And any members who are listening, I want to say hello. And I also want to say greetings to the fellow uh, panelists here. So uh, with that said, I want to go in and tell you a little bit about Sons and Daughters. Um, it's a fairly new organization. It was started in 2013. Um, we took our first applications in 2016. It's an organization for descendants of people who were enslaved in the United States. They're estimated to have been 10 million people enslaved um, right here in this country. And so the organization is, um, our, our mission is to commemorate our enslaved ancestors um, so they never ever will be forgotten. We also want to connect to each other who are descendants of enslaved people. And we also want to educate. Um, it's it's fa fascinating as I go around and uh, do presentations um, that the number of people who have no idea of the number of people who were enslaved, the history of slavery in this country is if if there wasn't for enslaved people, we'd probably be Canada. Um, you know, is is uh, is it? You know, they p played a significant uh, part of our history. Um, but is is so our one of our um, mission, our part of our mission is to make sure people uh, know about this history. Like in, even in New, uh, we, I go around and I make presentations about New Jersey. Many people have no idea uh, that New Jersey uh, uh, was a slave state um, and and one of the last uh, states uh, to free enslaved people. So the last person that was, if the last people that were enslaved in this country were living here in New Jersey. So um, it's it's a pretty fascinating um, uh, history. And, and so that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to, to do that. In order to join our organization, you'd have to be a descendant, a direct descendant, and you have to be able to prove that you are. So you'd have to start with that enslaved person and then um, uh, connect yourself to that person and it, and you will submit. And so we're going to talk more about how to, to do it, but uh, pretty much uh, that is what our organization is all about. We have a full board of people. We have about nine people on our board. Um, we have two registrars uh, who take our applications and um, uh, our, uh, our I, I don't know if I have a couple seconds. Oh, I have three minutes. I think I'm done with three minutes. I'll come back. <laughs> Tell you more later. Thank you, Evelyn. Uh, Diane, could you tell us a little bit about the state chapter of the AR? Indeed, thank you. And thank you, Andrew, for all of your emails. And thank you today, Regina, for, for hosting as well. The Daughters of the American Revolution is a nonprofit non-political volunteer women's service organization dedicated to promoting historic preservation, education, and patriotic endeavors. 
we have approximately 190,000 members, active members, with over 3,000 chapters in all 50 states and Washington, D.C. We have chapters in 12 different countries as well. Um, the DAR complex occupies an entire city block in Washington, D.C. Our official address is 1776 D Street, um, which is located literally right between the White House and the Washington Memorial um, Monument on, on 17th Street. Our library is one of the largest genealogical libraries in the United States, and we have 31 period rooms within our constructed buildings, um, which add to our museum and the museum um, programs are, some are permanent and some are changing exhibitions as well. And I think what's wonderful to note too is that this structure of buildings are um, mortgage free and totally owned by women. It's one of the largest complexes of buildings in the world owned by women and mortgage free. Wonderful, thank you so much, Diane. Is I there- is there anything um, specific you wanted to say about the New Jersey chapter or did there you, you go? Our New Jersey <laughs> State, thank you. Thank you so much. Our New Jersey State Society um, has been in existence since April of 1891. We have a state regent and along with the state regent, we have a state board of management that helps to, um, I say to to just run the organization from New Jersey's perspective. Um, we have a state vice regent. Some of these women might be on today. We have a state vice regent, a historian, a uh, I'm going backwards, a librarian, a registrar is most important. Our treasurer is there, our chaplain. So we have a whole slew of women that really help to make this organization run. Um, within the state, we have 45 chapters throughout all of New Jersey. I'm very proud to say that I'm sitting with two other women, Evelyn and Terry, who are both members of the Daughters of the American Revolution. And um, I'm thrilled to be here. And um, our state house is in Mercer County. It's called the Watson House. And that is located not too far from where you are sitting right now, Regina and Andrew. It's in Hamilton, and that is our state headquarters and, and our state museum as well. Awesome. Thank you so much. And last but not least, Mark, I have, I recently found out I have not one, but two Mayflower ancestors. Oh, good, so good, I'm. Good for I'm you. <laughs> I'm very interested and I'm very ashamed to say, I know one is John Alden, so I probably have some cousins on here. Hi cousins. Um, the other one is the, the oldest passenger who signed the Mayflower Compact and I cannot remember his name, but I will let you tell us about uh, the Mayflower Society of New Jersey. Okay. Okay. Well, um, never have to apologize for being a Mayflower descendant. Uh, that's not, that's, um, thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, it's a great honor to be with you today. And um, the General Society of Mayflower Descendants, also known as the Mayflower Society, were a lineage and membership society formed in 1897. And it's an organization made up of 54 different member societies. So it covers all 50 states, the District of Columbia, Europe, Canada, and Australia. The oldest one is, is in New York State. Um, in New Jersey was also one of the ones that was founded in the, in the late 1890s. So it became a consortium in 1897. Uh, we have over 30,000 members um, uh, and we've committed to their, and the whole mission of the Mayflower Society is committed to the research of the lineal descent of the Mayflower passengers and education about the pilgrims who traveled on the Mayflower in 1620. We want people to understand how they shaped Western civilization, what their 1620 voyage means today, its impact on the world, and to perpetuate their memory through excellence in research and the preservation of family history. The, the Mayflower Society is a publisher. Uh, we print books about Mayflower history, including volumes of lineage history we call the Silver Books, which talks about the, the different descendants. 
We offer scholarships to, to students of Mayflower ancestry, and we are a community resource. We have a two-acre campus in Plymouth, Massachusetts. You can see behind me, that's that's uh, on my, my uh, virtual background. That's uh, uh, the Mayflower Society House, originally built in 1754, uh, and originally owned by the great-grandson of, of Mayflower passenger Edward Winslow. So I'm coming to you from, from Plymouth, Massachusetts. And... Um, I know, I know when we, we talk about the application process, this is also what the Mayflower Society does. We we focus on a specific voyage of a specific year. So it's not about somebody that came over in 1623, 24, 25. You've got to be one of the 28 people of the original 102 that came over in the Mayflower in, in, December, in uh, 1620, one of the 28 that actually had descendants. Excellent. Thank you so much, Mark. And Andrew, I'm going to turn things over to you to ask the next question. All right. So we'll go in the reverse order. And Mark, uh, what is the application process to join the Mayflower Society? Okay. Um, well, if you're somebody like Regina and you know who your, your descendant is, or your ancestor, uh, when an individual wants to join the Mayflower Society, they work with any one of the 54 member societies to prepare their application forms. We are we are a bottom up, not a top down organization. So you work with your local societies with a local historian to come up with the paperwork to say, I believe I'm a, um, a Mayflower descendant. Here's my here's I believe I, I come through um, Winslow or Brewster or Bradford or, or Alden. And we work backwards, probably at 14, 15 generations at this point uh, to prove that lineage. Um, these historians will assist in compiling the information, assist in putting an application together. Additionally, we offer research services. We offer what we call a Mayflower lineage match service to help determine which line will offer you the best opportunity of becoming a member. Uh, once the application is completed, it gets sent to our headquarters in Plymouth to be verified. Uh, this verification process is required for membership to be accepted. Uh, the proper paperwork, which includes birth and death records, marital certificates, tax records, etc., must be included for the verification to take place. Uh, we want the long form of all pertinent parental information. The information is kept safe and confidential once we receive it, but um, we kind of uh, um, pride ourselves in being the gold standard. So it's it's not the easiest thing to uh, to to finish, but once you're done and you're uh, you're certified, you know that's a certificate you can put on the wall with pride and tell everyone from from now on that you are a Mayflower descendant. Great, thanks so much, Mark. Mm -hmm. uh, Diane, can you speak about the process for the uh, DAR? Indeed, um, just noting on Mark's um, comments. We have a wonderful resource within the DAR, between the DAR and the Mayflower Society called From Patriot to Passenger. Mm -hmm. And there's a list of men and women who are patriots of the Revolutionary War, proven patriots within the DAR, that then link back to the Mayflower Society. So that's, that's a fun document to peruse as well. Um, the application process for the DAR is probably... Um, similar to most societies where we ask that you provide your um, vital records for your first generation, second generation, and third generation. We're, we're different in the Mayflower Society and that the process begins with the woman who wants to become a member. Um, any woman 18 years or older, regardless of race, religion, or ethnic background, who can prove lineal descent from a patriot of the American Revolution is eligible to become a member. You can become a member in a variety of ways. You can go online to dar.org to read about steps to membership. You can email member, member services at dar.org to inquire about membership. And you can also pick up your phone and call headquarters and ask to speak to a membership representative as well for information to become a member. Oftentimes, though, it's word of mouth family to family, and um, a woman would work with a local chapter registrar, usually work with a local chapter registrar to um, help submit her papers and to make sure she has all of her documentation needed, which may include also um, tax records, probate records, census records, and such. Um, we ask that when women who come and, and show interest and want to join the DAR, that they 
bring with them um, a collection of their vital records of long form records, noting their parents' names on each of the birth certificates um, with them to their meetings so we can start the process easily for them. Um, and again, we always start with the woman who's there in front of us. Um, I'm just looking at my notes to see if I forgot anything. Um, yeah, so it is a lineal society and um, we just ask people to be patient with the process of membership. And sometimes it, it takes a while to collect death and birth and other vital records, sometimes marriage records, if that's something that you want to add. It's not necessary, but it's 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 helpful in some cases. But it's a process. The application is a process. And the length of time to have it evaluated um, can vary depending as to how correct your application is. And what by correct, I mean what documents you've submitted. Um, I submitted an application many years ago that did not have the members, the prospective members, parents' names on her birth certificate. So it got sent back to me and said, please ask the applicant to provide a long form birth certificate. It was like, ah, you know, what, what a beginner's mistake. But um, so I learned. All right. Thanks so much, Diane. You're um, Evelyn, can you speak about the, the process for the U.S. sons and daughters of the United States, or the Middle Passage? Absolutely. Okay. So our application uh, would look probably very similar to uh, any other lineage society where, um, but first of all, I will tell you about making sure people know who, who's eligible. So I'm going to read the eligibility clause. It's any person is eligible for membership in the National Society of Sons and Daughters of the United States Middle Passage who can provide direct lineal descent from a man, woman, or child of African descent who was forced into slavery in the United States of America, including its colonial days prior to the end of slavery as marked by the 13th Amendment of the United States Constitution, effectively effective December 1865 and the signing of the Indian Treaties of 1866. So if you have a, an, um, an enslaved person that also includes indentured servants, um, of African descent uh, within that time period, you identify who that person is, um, and you know through genealogy. And once you've identified that person, you you start with yourself, and you go back um, uh, to your parents and to that your grandparents, your great grandparents, until you get all the way to that enslaved person. You also um, have to document how you realize or how you know that person was enslaved. And, and in order to do that, there are many, many different ways of doing that. Uh, you can use negative um, uh, genie, uh, you know, uh, negative evidence, meaning that if you uh, have, if you can find out um, where they were and you can, uh, you know, there was some law that said all the free people were gone and the only people left were enslaved people. You can make an argument that your person was probably enslaved. Um, so you'd have to provide that documentation. And then once you uh, put that, uh, do that documentation together, you send it in to us and we send it off. Uh, we encrypt it. Uh, we try, we, we definitely keep your information um, uh, private. And um, we give that um, the application encrypted copy of the ap application to our registrars and they will go through methodically and check to see if your documentation uh, supports what you've given us. And then once you're done with that, you um, you know, you, once once you're all done with that, it goes to our um, our board. So the registrars, you send it to the registrars, they okay it. Then we go to it goes to the board, and then the board um, approves it. And then once they approve it, you get a great looking uh, certificate, and it it is mailed to you. And now you are a member of the organization. All right. Thanks so much, Evelyn. And Terry, can you talk about the process to join the Swedish Colonial Society? 
Well, it's actually a twofold process. First, you must become a member of the society. Um, and that basic membership is anyone who's interested in New Sweden, its people and its culture. Um, there's this, the second level is a forefather membership where you um, prove your lineage back to an approved forefather of Finnish or Swedish. Um, well, forefather members are active members who can prove descent from Swedish or Finnish colonists in the United States prior to the Treaty of Paris, marking the close of the uh, American Revolution in 1783. It is a special status membership within the society. And in that one, you have to do with any lineage of society. You, it starts with you and works back to that approved forefather. Um, you can use birth records, complete all those long form birth records that name the parents, a delayed birth certificate, um, mid midwife records. I've gotten many, many different ones, church records, social security card, et cetera, marriage records, death records. If you're gonna use a tombstone, you gotta be able to read the tombstone. And the only thing that is usable is what's been carved on that tombstone. You can't do use anything on the side of it. Uh, church records, uh, census records, federal land records, deeds, military pensions, uh, wills, school records, um, news, newspaper announcements, family Bibles, church records. There's many, many uh, different ways to do it, but it's got you have to link one generation back all the way back from yourself to that uh, approved forefather. My approved forefather is Hans Jurian, who, by the way, his grandson is was my first DAR proven patriot. Very, very interesting. Um, Thank you. All right, Regina. Hey, what are the benefits of joining your organization? And Terry, we will start with you again. Um, you'll get a twice yearly copy of the Swedish Colonial Society Journal, which covers many aspects of the society, along with interesting articles about the history and people of New Sweden and the people who lived around them. Um, we bring in the English, the Dutch, um, and the Germans. So um, it's published twice a year. And on our website, colonialswedes.net, you can go there. Anyone can go there now and read any of the articles um, that have been published since the inception of the uh, uh, society. We have yearly events such as the Forefather Luncheon where we honor our forefathers and any new forefather members who have proven their lineage back to that forefather. We have a, what's called a Yuma Dog Luncheon, which just means uh, Christmas dinner during the Christmas season at the Corinthian Yacht, Yacht Club in Tinicum. And this also features the decorating of this uh, for Christmas of the Swedish farmstead cabins, which are in uh, in Tinicum, Pennsylvania. And many there's many events at the Swedish farmstead in Tinicum put on by the township, the Lazaretto Immigration sta uh, Station, and our new archives and museum that are also in the uh, Lazaretto uh, Immigration Station. And the biggest one is our New Sweden Conference, which is held yearly in the first, it's usually the first Saturday in November in conjunction with the American Swedish Heritage Museum in Philadelphia. This year, the topic is contested, contested spaces, colonial and indigenous concepts of landscape use in the Delaware Valley, in the Delaware Valley. And it um, it's always very, very interesting. It's a day long conference. You get the conference and lunch. And this year it's being held at the American um, Revolutionary War Museum in Philadelphia. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Terry. Evelyn, uh, what are some of the benefits of joining the Sons and Daughters of the Middle Passage? I would say the the biggest benefit is um, if you, you know, if, if you um, believe in our mission, uh, you get a chance to be a part of that. So again, our mission is to commemorate our enslaved ancestors uh, to educate people about the history of slavery and to connect to each other. So um, if you are interested in, in doing any of those things, uh, then you know the biggest benefit is you'll be amongst other people who have the same uh, desires that you do. 
So that's probably the 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 biggest benefit. Um, we uh, we have a number of projects that we work on, uh, and I can tell you more about that. I believe that's another question that we're going to have coming up, but so I won't go into it now. But um, you know, we you know it is very very rewarding um, to talk about uh, these these people. Uh, their stories are amazing. Um, they are inspirational. They are, um, uh, you know, it's it's definitely something that helps you understand what it is to be an American, uh, because it, it's being an American is full of struggle. Uh, it's not a pretty story all the time. And um, and what I hope one day that and and many of our members believe the same thing that America could be a redemption story. You know how it started off um, with some very terrible things that it did to people, um, um, Native Americans, African Americans, and and how uh, it has eventually it, it hasn't done it yet, but how it will eventually um, you know repair those societies, um, those communities, and uh, and and get to a point where it has totally reconciled with its history. So the people who are part of this organization is helping in the United States to get to that point where it has reconciled its history. And we have finally healed from something it did um, many years ago. We are not anywhere close to that. Um, but if you're a member of this organization, you will help us reach that point. Thank you so much, Evelyn. And Diane, could you tell us uh, some of the benefits of joining Daughters of the American Revolution? Indeed. DAR provides women the opportunity to honor and preserve the legacy of their patriot ancestors, to make lifelong friends, to participate in unique social and service-oriented programs within our community, and to be involved in a variety of programs that provide something for everyone. I think one of the... Um, most exciting um, committees that has been created just recently within our national society, which has then trickled down to the state societies and we can encourage it at the chapter level as well, is uh, there's two actually. One is working with the Sons of the American Revolution and the Sons of the Revolution to work on projects together that we're, we all have similar mindsets and, and goals for our society and we, we want to see everyone succeed. The second committee that is quite new is um, the specialty research committee, where we do want to help women who may be descendants of women who are minority women or women who are related to um, patriots who might be considered to be minority or special research, whether it's Jewish, whether it's Cuban, whether it's Spanish through Galvez, whether it's African-American, we want to encourage um, all women to join the DAR and not to be put off by um, what they think the DAR is or was, but what we are today. Thank you. I am going to take advantage now of the fact that we have two additional DAR members on uh, this call. Terry and Evelyn, could I ask you each very briefly to talk about some of the personal benefits you found as being a DAR member? And Terry, I'll let you go first. I've met so many uh, wonderful women who've uh, enriched my life and hopefully I've enriched theirs. Also, I've uh, deepen my um, passion for history research. It's just been a wonderful um, organization to be in. You you never ever know until I've, I've met so many cousins I didn't know I had because I've, oh yeah, you're a, you're a descendant of him too. And it's just um, the camaraderie and fellowship among the ladies, uh, no matter what state they're from, no matter where, um, we're all, best friends immediately. Thank you, Evelyn. Yeah, um, it's a it's a long story, but Sons and Daughters, um, you know, kind of got its foundation uh, from this DAR. If you look at the applications, you, you would say, hmm, this looks familiar. Um, so I, the benefit for me is 
um, just just quickly tell you just this is one little story that um, I heard about the DAR on a show on a TV show, and I already had this idea for forming sons and daughters, and I heard about the DAR, and I said, oh man, that sounds exactly like what I want to do for sons and daughters. I go down to sons and I go down to the DAR in 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 DC. And um, because I like, what is DR? I had no idea what it was. And so I went down there and I met someone, a woman, um, uh, and I told her that I was interested in starting Sons and Daughters. And she she said, she said, I, I don't wanna, I, I can't talk to you uh, because I'm, I'm very, we're very busy right now, but if you wanna join, I could spend more time with you. And I said, yeah, 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 I wanna join. And so I had some of my paperwork with me and she um, looked through the paperwork. She put in a couple names in the database and found out that I had a, I had a, um, an ancestor, excuse me, an ancestor who was, um, uh, who, who fought for the American revolution. And I'm like, what? And so, and so I had to apply to DAR and learning that process helped me to lay the foundations for this organization. And great women involved in it. I have so many women of color uh, that I talk to uh, all the time. They're my friends, they're my sisters. Um, and they have also become members of this organization. Many of the members of this organization were members of, or are members of the DAR. So there's a, a big link uh, to it. And, um, and, and I hope, you know, the DAR is this just a slice of redemption story again, and they're on their way um, to, uh, and I hope they'll be an example to the, our country on how to be um, more inclusive. Thank you. And thank you both for allowing me to put you on the spot and ask. I wanted to take advantage since we had other members. Um, and also just a side note, the other reason, many, many of my genealogy questions are people who are looking to join DAR. Um, so I think as much information as we can get out there as possible is, is very fantastic. So thank you for indulging me. Mark, uh, we are going to close it out again with you. What are the benefits of, of for someone like me with some Mayflower ancestors of joining the Mayflower Society? Well, I think one of the takeaways that um, I hope people get from, from listening to this today, and it does tie in with DAR, is that... Um, if you, if you join an organization like the Mayflower Society or other lineage societies, it connects you to a network of people who share the same passion of genealogy, uh, same passion for history, and it links you to people who are, to whom you're literally related, albeit distantly, but, um, uh, you know, that you mentioned earlier, you, you got cousins out there, you know, that you're finding out. So this is a, this is a network of things that you're joining. It's akin to joining a national sorority or a fraternity or, or, or an organization like a Masonic Lodge. So this, is a, this is a link to your past, one that you may not know you have. You know, uh, like other organizations, um, there's, there's going to be benefits that are tangible for us. You know, you can put a certificate on the wall and you can show everyone that you are a, a Mayflower descendant. We have a thing called a Mayflower Quarterly Magazine that we literally send out four times a year that lets you know what's going on across the uh, country, across the globe with other, uh, uh, with other members. Um, so it's, uh, but it's, it's really, more than anything, I think like a DAR member, it's the link to your past that you may not have known you possess. And I think that's that's the biggest takeaway for anyone that's thinking of, of joining a lineage society is that um, that uh, it's it's a path it's a path and a past to relationships you may not have known existed. Thank you so much. Mark, and incidentally, to follow up on what you just said, I found out about my second Mayflower person because I was on a quest to join a very specific uh, lineage society who is not represented here today. 
uh, it was the Society of Colonial Witches. I was trying to see mm. if I had any witches in my family. They were all good little Puritans, though, <laughs> and none of them were accused of witchcraft. One of my ancestors had uh, the same surname as a Connecticut witch, a famous Connecticut witch, but was not direct line and not that person. And I'm reading and reading and reading. And then I'm like, oh, one of the Alden kids married into, um, it was either an Alden kid or a Blodgett kid, married into this other family of the oldest Mayflower person and was a direct descendant. And that's how I found out we had two instead of one because our Alden line is very well documented. My grandmother used it to join DAR and, and it's on the Alden Family Association website all of our all of our descendants are there but but yeah so so yeah i was trying to get into a society and that's how i found my other uh mayflower person oh, so very interesting <laughs> so andrew i will turn things over to you all right thanks this is our our last question before we get into the audience questions um what significant event or collaboration has your organization been involved in? And uh, Mark, can you tell us about uh, the Mayflower Society? Yeah, and this question kind of put a smile on my face because I, like everybody else, um, obviously COVID probably changed a lot of answers. And for us, um, uh, uh, certainly for the Mayflower Society, 2020 was was earmarked that's the 400th anniversary of the landing of the, of the, of the, of the voyage. So that kind of put a little crimp on what what it would, could really have been a really expansive answer for me, but um, um, the Mayflower Society. Uh, it, first of all, the, our, our most recent project that uh, you know see you see behind me, the Mayflower Society House, that's been being worked on for the past three years for with significant restoration and, and renovation efforts. So we're pleased that uh, we 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 just finished it around uh, Labor Day. So that's that's been the biggest most active thing but um our collaborations and and um and significant events really do tie on working with local businesses the local chamber of commerce um being a consortium with, with historic with historic organizations and um uh, and to try to make sure that we are we work with other um organizations in uh in the region particularly for us in plymouth massachusetts because of what would have been a significant event in uh, um, uh, in in 2020? Uh, so much was earmarked for that. With what's coming up now is the 250th anniversary of the of the Revolutionary War. Um, so for us, it's a lot of historic anniversaries and how we can tie in with that. So that's been the biggest collaborative efforts, as well as obviously working on um, taking advantage of of COVID and and getting our own properties restored and renovated. All right, thank you so much, Mark. Um, Diane, can you tell us about uh, some significant events or collaboration that the DAR has been involved in? Indeed. Um, recently, um, during COVID, COVID was just so horrible for a lot of reasons, and it, it shut down the headquarters of DAR, but it didn't stop women from doing good works and volunteering and making a difference in their communities as best they could. One of the main aspects um, of change within the DAR that we saw was the, and, and this is under the leadership of our previous president general, Denise Van Buren, um, who we were able to reconstruct, not reconstruct, but to, to renovate Memorial Continental Hall to the tune of $14 million. And that would have been almost impossible to do from top to bottom to looking at the floor and saying, yeah, this floor is good enough, right? And then realizing that the structure of the floor was not healthy and was not strong and had to be ripped up. And that you know, what was thought to be a, a um, small type of project became like an all engulfing project for our um, society. When you watch the Gershwin Awards, oftentimes they are hosted at the DAR Memorial Continental Hall. So that's that's pretty interesting. Um, and it's a beautiful space. And it's the largest space, largest space of, of concert hall space within Washington, D.C. Um, the other thing that we are getting ready for is America's 250th birthday that's coming up on the 4th of July in 2026. 
We kicked that off this coming December with the Boston Tea Party event in, in the middle of December and then concludes in 19, I'm sorry, in 20, 2033. Um, so we've got a whole lot of celebrating to do to celebrate America's birthday and we're excited about it. And we join, we ask Regina to join us um, as well in, in honoring of your grandmother and, and family. Diane, can I throw tea off the boat in Boston? They're, they're, they want you to. They want you to send tea, <laughs> loose tea up to Boston for this reenactment. And you receive a certificate if you do send some. So yes, yes. I'll send you the link to it. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks so much, Diane. Um, Thank Evelyn, you. can you tell us about an, an event or collaboration that the uh, Sons and Daughters U.S. Middle Passage have been involved in? Uh, yes, uh, we have, um, you know, we are invited all the time uh, to speak to different organizations. And um, I think I've gone to three other DAR, um, uh, including the, the Princeton um, DAR, to speak about sons and daughters. And um, so, and, and so they're, they're members of the DAR uh, that we always, we, well, not always, but we collaborate with uh, on different times. So we also work with um, with a, a member, uh, an organization called Ox, which is near and dear to our hearts. Um, it's Afro um, American Genealogical and Historical Society. It is a, a, a very large society and the DAR supports that too. Um, it's a large society, mostly African-American um, uh, people who are uh, focused on genealogy and history. And so we, they just had a, a big conference uh, just ended just last week. And we support that organization as well. We also um, work with any organization that uh, will fulfill, help us fulfill our member, I mean, our mission. So we give money, uh, donations to those organizations, um, cemetery restorations, uh, we also work with um, right now we're we're trying to work with the Angolan uh, embassy to help increase uh, their tourism. And, you know, a lot of African-Americans have Angolan ancestry. Um, those 16, 19 of people who, you know, came in on that 20 and odd, many of uh, all of them were from Angola. And so a lot of us are finding out that we have Angolan ancestry and we want to connect with people on um, in Angola. So we're working with the embassy uh, to, to make inroads in that, in that um, endeavor. We also do, a lot of us do speaking engagements all over the country. Uh, people call us. I just had a call just the other day from someone in North Carolina wanting someone to wanting someone from our organization to speak about um, you know this organization and about slavery. Um, we also do an annual. This is the biggest thing. We we're doing our eighth annual um, conference where we invite people to come in and talk about their enslaved ancestors, um, how to connect, help people do um you know apply to the organization uh we so we we have um it's it's we give out book awards uh we give out service awards every year uh it's a big celebration of uh, a big commemoration of our ancestors so that's coming up on June 7th and 8th of 2024 we're getting ready for it again it was it's uh it's probably going to be a hybrid um, so a lot online, some in person. So we're looking forward to rolling that out. The theme this year is going to be resistance, the underground railroad. And, um, we do a lot of different things. You check out our website. We have a, a digital quilt we're working on. People, uh, are do, we have folks who sing. Um, if you have a talent and we like to, we, we always ask people, God gave everybody a, a talent. We like for you to use that talent uh, to commemorate uh, your enslaved ancestors. So if you go to our website, you'll see a, a different people doing different things to commemorate their enslaved ancestors. So um, yeah, we do a lot. We're very busy. <laughs> Thank you so much, Evelyn. And then Terry, can you tell us about something that the Swedish Colonial Society has been involved in? 
Okay, for we actually just finished a 26 year project uh, in collaboration with the Swedish churches in New Jersey, Delaware, and uh, Pennsylvania to publish the nine volume colonial records of the Swedish churches in Pennsylvania, um, which is now complete and available for, for purchase. It covers the years of early years from 1768, and they tell of the uh, uh, frightful times during for people during the American Revolution when the pastor of Glory Day was a Tory and also had a little bit of mental instability and the church building was uh, excorporated by the British soldiers and they actually uh, um, put their uh, horses in there and it made it made the building unusable for about three years. The Glory Day records include minutes of the vestry meetings and appointments, details on the church and parsonage improvements, disciplinary actions, marriage, baptism, and burial records, which are the most important things for those of us who uh, join lineage societies, uh, lists of contributors to the building, uh, few assignments, and that can tell that can put a person in a place and a time, if you know that uh, Hans Jurian uh, had the Q number four in um, that church, you can know that he was there in 1700 and paid his pew rent. Um, it also covers the minister's salaries, civil records, including the church, land rent, land grants, deeds, petitions for the by the congregation, lawsuits because they sued each other quite quite often, probate records, newspaper articles, and then it also is an extensive record of Sweden's American mission in the archives at Uppsala. They include letters from the pastors of Gloria Day, letters on petitions from the congregation. Uh, the records show that not unfrequently the pastor and the congregation at uh, Gloria Day were at odds with the Swedish Lutheran consistory and back in Uppsala in Sweden, and to the point where the... Um, Swedish church in Sweden didn't send us any more uh, uh, pastors, and that's why we became Episcopalian. The project covers not only the records of Gloria Day Church, but also its offshoots. St. Gabriel's Church in Douglasville, Pennsylvania, Berks County, Christ Church of Upper Marion, Montgomery County in, uh, Philadelphia, in Pennsylvania, St. James of King, King Sessing in West Philadelphia, and the records of the also document the offshoot and, and splitting off of the New Jersey residents to establish their own church in Raccoon Creek, which is now Swedesboro. And finally, of the records, the records also pertain to Holy Trinity Search Church in Wilmington and its offshoot, St. George's Church in Penn's Neck, records which uh, previously had not been translated and published. So you can find a lot of genealogical records in there. And if you go to colonialsweeds.net on our landing page and go down about three quarters of the way, you can find out how to purchase those books. Um, because if you're trying to get back to um, uh, uh, VAR or another lineage society, there's a lot of available records that will, that will give you the information that you need. Okay. Terry, could I just ask a quick follow-up question? Sure. You mentioned that the records, some of the records were translated. Were they originally in they Swedish? They were originally in Swedish. Oh, wow. So they kept that up even through the 18th century, even yes. after. Oh, wow. Very cool. That was part of the problem. Um, the uh, surrounding churches uh, spoke, in their, their uh, masses were said in English, but the Swedish Lutherans, um, these the uh, in Uppsala required that they uh, preach in in Swedish. Well, but by the time 1700 got there, um, they had been there since 1638, and the grandkids didn't speak Swedish anymore. So the church was losing uh, people left and right because other religions were saying, "Come and be with us, because we speak in English. You don't have to sit there and not understand what's going on." Um, and that was when the Swedish uh, churches in the unit, well, what would become the United States, uh, broke from from Sweden because um, we needed to be able to uh, listen to our our uh, pastors in English. All right. So the original you. records were in Swedish. That's fantastic. Thanks so much for sharing, Terry. 
All right. Well, if anybody has any questions, we'll be happy to to take them now. Um, and you can submit them using the the Q and A or the chat buttons. Um, and uh, Regina, do you want to kick us off with the first one? Sure. I see one uh, in the Q and A. And uh, this is for Diane, although I'm sure with uh, their experience, our other two DAR members can chime in as well. Is there anyone in the DAR that can help me connect a possible revolutionary patriot that I discovered through ancestry through lines? Absolutely. Um, we have approximately 45 women just off the top of my hat that I can think of that could help this person as they are 45 chapter registrars that could help this woman. Um, depending on her location as to where she lives, um, we, we can make that connection for her. Um, through lines are only as good as the other person putting in the information. So it, again, we would ask to start with the prospective members birth certificate, her parents' birth certificates, and, and to go through her line to her grandparents, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but yes, there are lots of people who are willing to help her. I would recommend that she fill in a membership uh, query at dar.org, and they can connect her with a local chapter and a local registrar to help her document that lineage from herself all the way back to that patriot that served says the former state registrar. We're a team. I just have to say that DAR is a team. We're a team. So thank you, Terry, for adding that. You're welcome. The local local chapter uh, reg, uh, registrars are awesome. I'm not sure which one this is directed at, but um, are there any fees to join the organization? Um, if anybody wants to jump in and, and take it, that's fine. Our fees are only uh, $65 for the initial application, and it's $25 a year. Um, I want to add that you can, uh, children, we just admitted, uh, we, we just allowed children to join at any age. So you can, uh, uh, their, um, their fees are, um, there's a different fee structure, but primarily that's it. For us, it's $45 as a basic membership, just to be um, a member of the Swedish Colonial Society. Once you're a member, you can apply to be a forefather member, and that's $60 um, for each forefather member that you Prove you can prove more than one. Many of us have a bunch of them, and our yearly dues are forty five dollars. Mayflower Society's yearly dues, or the General Society's yearly dues, are one hundred fifty dollars per year. But then there's also a a fee to be a part of the um, of the member society in which you join. Now you don't have to join. Uh, a New Jersey person doesn't have to join New Jersey. They can join any one of the 54 societies. So you are allowed to shop around if you'd like. Um, so, and it's not a uniform price. Uh, Mississippi costs significantly less than New York, you know, then. Uh, so there is a fee to join the member society for the general society. It's $150 per year. So it's uh, um it, it's whatever your pocketbook allows uh, to uh, as to which society you'd like to join. We do have an application fee of $75. And then there are the national dues, the state dues and the chapter dues that are collected at the same time. The national dues are dependent upon whether or not you're a member at large meaning that you are a member of the DAR, but not connected with any state society versus those women who are connected to a state society and to a chapter specifically. And chapter dues are very based on the chapter, whatever the chapter sets their dues at. And currently right now, the state dues per year for New Jersey are $15. I don't see any other questions. Do you have anything, Regina? 
Yes, Althea pointed out in the uh, in the chat that my ancestor, my second Mayflower line ancestor, was James Chilton. So thank you, Althea. I did not um, remember that. Could I ask a question to close us out? Sure. Andrew, and this is for Evelyn. Evelyn, I want to start working on a project with my colonial ancestors uh, because I have not been real careful with this. And in many cases, I haven't examined wills um, and other documents where uh, I'm, I'm looking for whether or not they were enslavers. I would like to go back and do that. Does the sons and daughters of the Middle Passage have some some program for somebody like me who might want to assist someone if I find out my ancestors are enslavers and get that information out there so that somebody could potentially join? Uh, yeah, well, we collect information. So sometimes people will reach out to us and give us some documentation that will, you know, they maybe they found a will and their ancestor had enslaved like you know 10 people and on that will they'll list them and people will donate those to us um and transcribe and and send them to us so we we're collecting them and in hopes that eventually we'll come up with a database so that we can put that information out there and help people connect to their ancestors so yes please send it to us awesome i have not started yet but I, the wills that I've looked through so far have not listed anyone. That does not mean my ancestors were not enslavers. I haven't done any newspaper research or advertisement, advertisements, anything like that yet. If we're talking way back, there wouldn't have been any newspapers. So I, I don't know. But that's one of my projects that I, I want to work on um, in the future. Make sure you look at land records because those colonial folks uh, got a lot of land and they used that land. Uh, they needed people to work the land. So they they bought a, uh, enslaved people. So land records are another form that I would suggest you look at. Awesome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All righty. Well, I think that is this everything for today. So we can go ahead and close it out. Um, first, I'd like to thank all of our panelists for, for speaking today and sharing uh, fantastic information about their, their organizations. Um, and I encourage you all, if, if you're interested, to, to reach out um, to find more information. Um, and uh, in the, the follow-up email that I'll be sending out, there'll be a link to each organization's homepage. So um, you will have that for, for your own personal use. Um, I'd also like to thank Luce Villarreal, one of our colleagues here who helped put this together. Um, they did a fantastic job of scheduling and organizing everything. So I'd like to just give a little shout out to them. Um, and last, I'd like to thank everybody for, for attending today. Um, you make our programming worth it and we appreciate your, your patronage. So um, just look out for that follow-up email that I'll have also a link to this recording um, in case you missed anything. So I'll just close and say, everybody be safe, be well, and hopefully we'll see you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Bye-bye.